Thank you all. Uh, I, I know not all of you are here from your own free will, so I apologize for that, but uh, glad to have you anyway. And it's, it's a real pleasure to be back at Radley. I had a, a really good time last, uh, last year, and the video we took of last year's talk has done very well on YouTube, so that is, uh, that is uh, excellent. As I think everybody knows, and I know you've had a series here of speakers on the issue of free will, free will has become a, a major uh, issue, particularly in the United States, and I think slowly uh, the United States once in a while exports something. It's been exporting this, these new ideas with regard to free will uh, to uh, the rest of, uh, of the world and certainly uh, to the UK. In, in the US today, many universities have free speech zones, areas in which you can go and actually speak your mind with nobody censoring you. I always thought an entire university was a free speech zone. It turns out, no, that only certain places within the universities, you can say that. Some universities have created what are called safe spaces, where you can go after you've maybe heard a lecture like, from somebody like me that has upset you a little bit, and maybe there'll be some teddy bears and soft music and something, you know, somebody to, to, to ease your mind and, and to just, just calm you down. Um, I am actually speaking, uh, I'm, I'm doing an event next week, actually a week from today, at uh, King's College London. And uh, the student union there has demanded, as a condition for doing the event, that safe space marshals attend the event. These are people who are paid by the student union, paid fairly well, I understand, by the student union, to make sure that I and the other participants in this event don't say anything that might really offend the audience. And they have the authority to shut the event down if they believe we are offending people. Now, this has become quite prevalent in the United States. Now, I don't want to exaggerate the cause because there's a lot of exaggeration about these things. It, it particularly has infected the best universities. So the further away you get from Harvard and from Princeton, and particularly from Brown University, the less impact these kind of ideas have. But certainly the top universities in the United States, these ideas have real credence. They have real force. When somebody like Ben Shapiro, a conservative commentator who, with whom I agree with on some issues and disagree passionately on other issues, but fairly mainstream conservative spokesman, goes to some college campuses there are literally riots in the streets where people get beaten up and pepper sprayed and where the police stand by and let this happen and he is basically prevented from speaking on campuses. Many speakers, even people like Condoleezza Rice, again, a conservative, but nobody particularly radical, served in the Bush administration, gets invited to speak on campuses. There is a demand to have her withdrawn and many university administrations have succumbed to those demands and uh, they have not had the benefit of having a speak. Ayan Hirsi Ali, who I don't know if you guys here know who Ayan Hirsi Ali is, but she is a, a brave woman raised under Islam, uh, was forced into a marriage or, or arranged marriage. She escaped before the marriage happened. She landed up in the Netherlands. She, she is an outspoken critic of Islamism, of radical Islam, of fundamentalist Islam, a very courageous, brave woman. She speaks up a lot about issues related to the Islamic religion. She is now persona non grata on many American campuses because of her views, because of what she says might offend certain people in the audience. Now, I believe this might be the most important issue that we face today. This is the issue on which will determine whether Western civilization, in my view, will survive or not. Whether our quality of life, our standard of living, the freedoms that we take for granted will survive. This is not a trivial issue at the boundaries, as some issues are. This goes to the heart of what freedom means. It goes to the heart of what Western civilization is. So let's start maybe before we get to really the, the, the core of what free speech is and, and why it's such an important issue. 
Let's talk a little bit about Western civilization. Because one of the questions asked, well, are we on the rise or are we in decline? But there's a previous question that has to be asked. What is Western civilization? What do we mean when we say Western civilization? Because this has become a real contentious issue. Is Western civilization determined by the color of our skin? Is it determined by our religion? Is it determined by our ethnic background? What makes Western civilization Western civilization? And until we, we can define that, until we can explain what Western civilization actually is in coherent, succinct terms, it is hard to talk about a rise or a decline of this thing that I think we're somewhat afraid to define. And certainly, those who believe that it is the color of the skin that determines Western civilization, they are very vocal. So if we don't believe it's color of skin, as I don't, I believe it's ideas, then we better speak up because otherwise they will be the ones to dominate the conversation. Those who believe it's religion that determines Western civilization, again, are very vocal. Those of us, like myself, who don't necessarily believe it's religion need to speak up and define it. So I think the first thing that needs to be done, and this is already going to be controversial and contentious, is what is Western civilization? Now, I believe that Western civilization is rooted in two fundamental ideas, one a derivative of the other, but without which Western civilization is meaningless. Both ideas are ideas that come out of Greece, of ancient Greece, of ancient Greek philosophers, primarily Aristotle, and are embraced by what I consider the most important period in European history, or in global history for that matter, which is the Enlightenment. The Enlightenment was when? When was the Enlightenment? Just to check if you're awake. Now, no, it's cheating. You're not supposed, they're supposed to answer. 18th century. So they, you can take approximately the entire 18th century. It ends a little before the end of the 18th century and begins maybe even in the, the end of the 17th century, depending on how you define it. But it's basically that period of the 18th century. And what, are the, what is the core idea of the Enlightenment? And partially you can think of this as who is the first thinker of the Enlightenment? Where does the Enlightenment kind of come from? And to me, in many regards, the first figure of the Enlightenment is not a philosopher, but a scientist. The first real figure of the Enlightenment is Isaac Newton. Because what does Isaac Newton teach us? Isaac Newton was a real revolutionary in many respects. Because he taught us that we can explain the physical world not from reading ancient books, not from people ex telling us what the truth is, but we can explain it using logic, using mathematics, using observation, using experimentation. He taught us that science was efficacious. Science could explain the world. The human mind, by itself, could explain what's going on in the world. Reason was this incredibly powerful tool. And that's the first and most crucial idea of the Enlightenment. It's the efficacy of individual human reason. We do not need philosopher kings to tell us what the truth is. We do not need authoritarian dictators to tell us what is right and what is wrong. We do not need preachers and popes and mystics to explain reality to us. Reality is available to every single individual, as Aristotle explained, through our senses and our minds. We can discover the truth. And if we can understand how objects relate to one another, how force works in the world, which is not that hard in physics now, you know, I know some of you are probably taking physics right now and think Newtonian physics is nuts, but it's relatively easy. The mathematics and the explanations are not that difficult. Most people get it. Yes, I can see what's going on here. And if we can understand the physical world around us, people started thinking in the 18th century, huh, maybe we can make other decisions for ourselves as well. If reason is efficacious, then maybe, maybe we can make our own political decisions. Maybe we can decide what profession we should have, not be committed to a guild 
not be committed to what our fathers and grandfathers did, but actually choose for ourselves what we should be doing. Maybe we could choose our own leaders. And it's not an accident that Locke right, is writing at about the same time about the rights of individuals. And individuals have rights because they can take care of themselves, because they can think, because they have reason. They have the capacity to understand the world and make decisions for themselves. They don't need other people. They don't need mother government. They don't need authoritarians to tell them how to live their lives. Now, we all take all this stuff for granted today because we're the great beneficiaries of the Enlightenment. Now, I know this is always tricky to a British audience, but probably the greatest achievement of the Enlightenment politically was the establishment of the United States of America. <laughs> because what does the Declaration of Independence of the United States of America declare to the world? That every individual, every individual, has a right to his own life, his own liberty, and his own pursuit of happiness. Right? Why? Because he has the capacity to think for himself. And this is the second principle that comes out of the Enlightenment that makes Western civilization Western civilization. And that is individualism. Again, coming out of Locke and coming out of the Declaration of Independence. The idea that what's of value is the individual, not the tribe, not the group, not the ethnic relationship, but who you are as an individual. That is what is sacred. That is the moral unit of importance. So two ideas make the enlightenment, reason and individualism. That's Western civilization. People who adopt the ideas of reason and individualism, in that sense, are Western. People who don't, and they might live in the West, are not advocates of Western civilization. Is reason and individualism on the rise in some places in the world? And they're in decline where they were born, in Western Europe, in England, and in the United States of America. And that's what we're fighting. We're fighting for the idea, not for an ethnic group, not for color of skin, not for religion, but for these two ideas, these twin ideas of reason and individualism, the sanctity of the individual and the competence of his mind, of his ability to know reality. Now, how is this related to free speech? Why is this related to free speech? Because if you have the right, if you can think, if you can create, then that thinking and that creation is meaningless unless you can express that creation, unless you can express yourself in writing, in speaking. Galileo could have discovered the truth about Right? The earth going around the sun, not the other way around. But what gave it value and meaning to all of us, and to everybody, is the fact that he could express it. Now, he couldn't, because right? there was no free speech back then. So what happened to Galileo? He was put in house arrest. And of course, he didn't produce much after that, because he knew the consequences. The only way to discover truth is to argue for it. It's to argue against it. It's to debate. It's to discuss. Now, so the only way for us to discover truth, the only way for us to discover what's good for human being, what leads to human beings flourishing, what leads to human being success, is to use our reason to look out into the world, to try to understand it, and to debate it with other people trying to understand it, and to figure out what is right and what is wrong, what is true and what is false. So during this enlightenment, one of the principles that they all agreed on, all the Enlightenment thinkers agreed on, is wait a minute, if we are going to debate and, and think and try to discover the truth, what we don't want are limits on what is allowed to be debated and how we should debate. Now it's true, a lot of people say stuff that has nothing to do with the truth, that has nothing to do with the pursuit of the truth. But then the question is who gets to decide? What is in pursuit of truth? What is a debate that's going to lead to positive outcomes? And what's the debate that's going to lead to negative outcomes? Who gets to be the arbitrator of what speech is OK and what speech is not OK? What speech is going to lead 
to some great achievement or what speech is just wasted. Because a lot of stuff people say is a waste of time. A lot of stuff people say is just to insult. A lot of stuff that people say is just stupid. I mean, you might think that, I might think that, but who gets to actually decide? And who gets to actually shut the person up? One of the, one of the understandings that comes out of the idea that reason is so important, so crucial for human survival, is the idea that the enemy of reason, the enemy of reason is force. What prevents you from thinking? What stops you in your tracks? I mean, you can think under most conditions. You can advance the truth under most conditions. But there's one thing I can do to you that shuts down your mind, that stops you from thinking. And let's put a gun to your head. Tell you, if you think these thoughts, you're going to jail. Or if you don't do what I tell you, if you don't mouth what I tell you, I'm going to shoot you. You're just going to do what you're told because nobody wants to die. Force is the enemy of reason. And therefore, force, Locke argues, and many of the thinkers of Enlightenment argue, must be extracted from human society. We don't deal each other with force. How do we deal with each other? With argument, with reason, with debate, with discussion. We're not going to agree. That's OK. As long as we don't punch each other, as long as we don't pull out guns on each other, it's OK to disagree. Disagreement is part of life. And again, who is to decide who is right or wrong except for you and me and everybody? Each one of us has to make decisions about what's right and what's wrong, what's true and what's false. There is no force in terms of making those decisions is wrong. It shuts down the mind. It prevents the discovery of truth. So the idea of reason is undercut when we try to limit the scope of truth or the scope of speech, the scope of expressing one's thoughts. Now think about it. So people say, yeah, but some speech is offensive. Yeah. Almost every truth, new truth, is offensive. And now, a lot of falsehoods are offensive, too, but also truths. You know, Galileo really offended the Catholic Church. They were really upset. Every new truth, every new discovery, every new anything is offensive to somebody. Like Uber, everybody know Uber? Really offends taxi drivers. Any advancement. The automobile offended people who are building buggies. Anything new is going to be offensive to somebody. Does that give that somebody the right to shut you down because their emotions were hurt? So reason, our belief in reason, our dedication to reason, the idea of the efficaciousness of reason demands that we be allowed to speak. And that force, that, that force be banned from human relationships. That you not be allowed to silence people because you don't like what they have to say. So what do you do with people you don't like what they have to say? You can argue with them or you can walk away. You don't have to listen to them but you don't have a right to shut them up. You cannot use force against them in order to shut them up. If you do, then now you're setting yourself as an authority over what is right and what is wrong, what is true, what is good, and you're now limiting the scope of what is al you're allowed to think, what you're allowed to speak, what you're allowed to write. You're limiting the scope of where we can seek truth, seek what is right and what is wrong, you're limiting the scope of human thinking. You're limiting the scope of human reasoning. And you're saying, I, whoever the I is, the government, the, 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 the university administrators, whoever they are, are now saying, we know what's good for you. 
We can now run your life. We can now make decisions for you. You're undercutting the very foundation of freedom and liberty, which is the individual's ability and right to think for themselves and therefore to express themselves. One other thing that's happening in our modern culture. Whereas we used to regard reason as our means for knowing reality, we used to regard reason as the way in which we arbitrate disputes and discover the truth. It seems like over the last few decades, we have elevated emotions above reason. So now it doesn't matter whether what you're saying is true or false, right or wrong. What matters is what kind of emotion it invokes in me. If you say something that upsets me, then you're not supposed to say it. We've elevated emotions as our guide to what is true and what is not. But what are emotions? Where do emotions come from? And can we trust our emotions to tell us what is right and what is wrong, what is good and what is bad, what is true or what is not true? Right? Our emotions don't want to understand Newtonian, phys Newtonian physics. It's too hard. Right? Where do emotions come from? Are they just there? How do we, where do we get them from? Chemicals. What's that? Chemicals in the brain. Chemicals in the brain. But is it just random chemicals? So, you know, you, you, you just happen to have a certain emotion. It's just whatever. Whatever chemicals happen to be in the brain at that point in time. What's that? You're subconscious. Again, so in a sense, it's something that you're not in control of. That is absolutely true. But what, why is it that you have a particular emotion be, from a particular cause? Right? What is it, I don't know, that you, you feel fear when you see a dog bark? Some of us feel fear. I'm afraid of dogs. Some of you might not be, right? But I might be, and you might not be. What is it? We have different chemicals in our brains? Why is my subconscious reacting in one way and your subconscious reacting in a different way? Genetics? So some would say it's genetics. We're determined by a certain genetic code in our minds, and that determines what emotions we will have. It turns out that many of these emotions we don't have when we're little, that we kind of develop them as we grow up. Where do emotions come from? Yeah. What's that? We've been brought up that way. So we've been brought up to have certain emotions. Now that's, there's a lot of truth to that. I believe emotions come from conclusions we've already made in our mind. So we've come to certain conclusions because we were brought up that way, because a dog scared us when we were three, because of whatever conclusions. We've come to some conclusions in our mind. And it's automatized, so it's in our subconscious. So now, when something triggers it, it just happens. Does it mean it's right? No, it just means that our subconscious is feeding us this emotion right now in response. How do I know if something's right or wrong, whether the dog is really scary or not? I look at it. Is it, you know, what's it behaving? How is it behaving? I think about it. Is this a type of dog that's dangerous or isn't it? It's a little poodle, right? Or, isn't it, or is it a dog that's not dangerous? I use my mind. I use my senses. I use my reason to discover the truth. The emotion is just telling me, based on past things that have happened to you, this is how you are responding right now. So what? I, I mean, you guys are too young for this, but you know, you fall in love. You love this girl. Or, we're almost all boys here, right? You love this girl. And you're in love, right? Heart's beating. It's really powerful emotion. Because you believe certain things about her. And then you discover something negative. She's cheated on you. Your emotion, you reason that, you know, she's no good. You don't want to have anything to do with it. It takes a while for your emotions to catch up because emotions tend to lag. That's why we hold on to things that we know are not good for us anymore. Right? Uh, we know certain foods are bad for us, but emotionally it's hard to give up. Now, I'll tell you, if you actually convince yourself that some foods are bad for you and you take it seriously and you think about it enough, you stop desiring those foods. I gave up on dessert 
tonight, right? Where are you? Quite easily, it was no temptation because I don't do desserts anymore. It used to be hard. I used to have to work at it, right? Really have a, have a mental effort around it, but you automatize it. What should guide your life is your reason, not your emotion. If you're getting upset because somebody says something, so grow a spine. Is it what they said true or is it false? If it's true, you should thank them. If somebody criticizes you, then it turns out the criticism is true, then you grow because you've discovered something new about yourself you didn't know before. You should say thank you. I didn't know I was doing X, Y, Z, right? If it's false, if somebody criticized you and they're wrong, why the hell do you care? It's their problem that they're wrong, not you. If you hold something that's wrong, it's your problem. If somebody else holds something that's wrong, it's their problem. So if somebody comes up here and says something, out, something outrageous that you find offensive, then it's the speaker's problem if what they said is false. And it's your problem if you're getting offended by something the speaker said that's true. If something they said is true, then you should think about it. You should consider it. You should change your mind. But to silence the speaker is to silence thought. To silence the speaker is to silence reason. To silence the speaker is ultimately to silence everything that's made Western civilization a success which is the ongoing, constant pursuit of truth, the ongoing, constant acceptance that the evaluator of what's right for me and what's right for you is you. I get to decide for myself, and you get to decide for yourself. There is no authority, right? There, and right now, you're in school, so there is an authority. It's called your teacher, and you better, you better you know, answer the exam questions right. But in life, there is no authority. There's you. That's it. You get to decide what's right. And you get to suffer the consequences when you're wrong. You are your final authority. And the person on stage, whoever it is, they're their own final authority. And if they're wrong, and they might be wrong, that's their problem. That's their issue. So my view is freedom of speech should be absolute, right? as long as it doesn't turn into action, right? as long as it's not inciting violence, right? as long as it's not involved in committing fraud. But all of those, in a sense, are actions. They're meant to act on other people, to get other people to do something they wouldn't otherwise do. But if you're not inciting violence, and if you're not committing fraud, then you should be able to say whatever the hell you want to say. Nobody should be forced to listen. Now, I guess you guys are forced to listen to me tonight, but nobody should be forced to listen. People should be able to walk out. People should be able to boo. People should be able to object. I have no problems, I've, and I've had it plenty of times, of audiences booing me. Great. You're expressing your opinions just like people clapping, right? You should be able to, you have, a, you have the right to express your opinions just as I do. But you don't shut me down any more than I shut you down, in a sense of the ability to speak. Uh, it, 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 if people are too sensitive to hear certain ideas, then I think we've got a real problem in controlling our emotions. Again, we've elevated emotions above reason. Emotions are not tools for discovering truth. Emotions are not tools of cognition. I mean, emotions are great, don't get me wrong. You, you want to feel, right? But you don't want to be guided in your life by your feelings. You should be guided in your life by your reason, by your mind. So Western civilization is reason and individualism. Reason depends, relies on our ability to express ourselves, our ability to convey what we believe is true and right to other people. Nobody has the obligation to believe us. Nobody has the obligation to listen to us. All of us have the obligation to leave people alone, to not use violence, not use force against them. If we value Western civilization, if we want Western civilization to continue, to continue its march towards progress and its march towards truth, we must allow freedom of speech. Thank you all.
questions. This is where things can light up a bit um, yeah. when you take issue. And doubtless uh, Dr. Brooks has got some examples that he wants to uh, advocate that you may not agree with. So any questions, please, in the audience? We've got a microphone to operate with, things that people might be worried about. Um, let's start with Jack. Can I just pass that back to you? Uh, yeah, you said um, that we are our own final authority. Um, surely the government is our final authority, imposing rules and, and laws on us, and we have to act within those bounds. Um, are there limits to what we can and can't do in relation to those laws? Because surely if we, if we can say anything we want, you know, racism and homophobia shouldn't be an issue in if, what you're saying, effectively. Yeah. Yeah, God help us if the government is our final authority. Uh, that is the end of Western civilization. That is, that is what government was uh, before, you know, uh, uh, the, the 1776 and the changes politically that have happened in the world uh, since then. No, government is our agent. Government is our servant. Government is not, you are not the government's servant. The government is your servant. And it is there to do one thing and one thing only, in my view. And that is protect you from people using force against you. That's it. It's not there to tell you what the truth is. And when it does, we all get into trouble. Right? You know, we were just talking over dinner about, in America, the food pyramid. So there's a food pyramid. The government tells you what's good food and what's bad food. And it turns out they've been wrong for like 40 years. So Americans are all fat and obese. Why? Because they take government as an authority. And government's not an authority. Government shouldn't have a food pyramid. It's not a government's business what you eat or don't eat. The do your doctor should tell you, based on science, what's good and what's bad for you to eat, not government. Government is a gun. It's force. It's coercion. The only reason to use a gun is in self-defense. The only reason to use coercion is to protect us. It's not to impose their will on us. So uh, my whole perspective on government is, government is supposed to do one thing. It's to protect me. Otherwise, it leaves me alone. And it's certainly not my authority on anything. Now, it exerts authority on all of us, unfortunately. But that's where I think we get into trouble, is we've given way too much authority uh, to government. Now, is, uh, is homophobic speech OK? Uh, is racist speech OK? Well, it depends what you mean by OK. It's disgusting, it's, it's morally offensive, it's horrible. You have a right to be morally offensive and morally horrible and, and, a, and an awful human being. You have a right to express yourself in any way. And nobody has to listen to you. And if it's a private institution, like, like this is a private school, they certainly have a right to limit what you say to what's acceptable to the private organization, but you can go out there on your property, in your newspaper, on your radio show, on your whatever, and express whatever views you like. The, the, if, you think about, if you think about free speech in Europe, the first, remember I was born in Israel, right? So the first offense against freedom of speech in Europe post-World War II were laws in Germany that banned what? Anybody know? Banned Holocaust denial. Now, Holocaust denial is stupid, evil, wrong, disgusting, everything, right? And I certainly know because I had relatives who died in the Holocaust. It happened. And people I know who were there, right? But you have a right to deny anything. It doesn't offend me that you're denying the Holocaust. It just makes you stupid. And even if it offends me, so it offends me. That's not the standard by which you should articulate your speech. If you want to be wrong, then be wrong. It's the, the best thing to do with people who are racists and people who are homophobic or people who are Holocaust deniers is to ignore them. Because when they're ignored, when they have no audience, when people are not all hysterical about them, they go away and they tend to shut up. Most of them are doing it because they want the attention. Right? If you want an example of that, think Milo. Right? He wants attention. Right? So he's offensive, and he tries to offend anybody he can because it drives attention towards him. It's not, there's no real content there. There's mostly just offense. But, you know, you don't have to offend people in order to convey truths. Right? Purposefully offend people. Yeah. 
Um, the two big upsets in the last few years uh, for the liberal narrative that you seem to rail against are obviously the election of Donald Trump and Brexit. From a free speech point of view, do you see those as net gains because they have upset the liberal consensus? I can't, I can't think of how the election of Donald Trump could be pro-free speech, <coughs> given that he, that he spent so much time um, as president of the United States, not as a private citizen. I think there's a big difference between when you're a private citizen and you complain about certain things and when you're president and you complain about certain things. Because when you're president, there's an implicit gun in your hand. There's an implicit threat. So when he says things like, and he said this, he says things like, I really don't like the Washington Post and I don't like what they write to me. And maybe we'll look at Amazon and see if they violated an antitrust. When, I don't know if you know, but the guy who owns Amazon, the CEO of Amazon, Jeff Bezos, owns the Washington Post. Basically saying, either shut up, you know, be nice to the government, be nice to the authority, or we will go after you. That is incredibly dangerous for free speech. When he constantly berates the mainstream media. Now, I'm a huge critic of the mainstream media. I think almost all media in, in the West is tilted dramatically left. And it's all biased. And if you read it carefully, you see the bias constantly. The BBC is unbelievably biased, right? But OK, so you can recognize the bias. There's a difference between that and calling what they do fake news. There's a difference between that and, and berating them in a way that suggests they should be shut down, they should disappear, they should go away, which I think is what he does. Again, from the position of government, you can do that as a private citizen, free speech. But once you're in the government, you've got that implicit threat. It's very dangerous. I view, I view uh, uh, Donald Trump's election actually as a move against free speech. Uh, it, it, it kind of, today you've got two threats to free speech. On the left, You've got the whole, we got to be sensitive, you can't offend anybody. And on the right, we cannot accept views that, uh, that are, that are anti-the nation. There's a good example now in Poland. I don't know if, if you, Poland just passed a law that it is illegal to say the words Polish concentration camp. Because they weren't Polish concentration camps, they were German concentration camps that happened to be in Poland. Now, even if historically that is correct, Really, you're making illegal somebody saying something that you view as false, and that's from the right, right? So you're seeing threats from both sides to free speech. I think most of the threats right now in the United States are from the left, and most of the threats in Europe seem to be, you know, particularly in Eastern Europe, from the right, and, and the rest of Europe from both sides. So I think it's a danger that's coming in from both sides. Oh, a Brexit. I don't know if Brexit has an impact on free speech. I haven't really thought about that. Um, you know, Brexit is good or bad, depending on what you guys do with it. It looks like you're going to mess it up and screw it up completely, so it's probably a bad thing. Uh, the, the, you know, there's a possibility something good will come of it if the backbenchers get their way and not the people in government, but it's unlikely. I think you're going to mess it up. <laughs> Um, you talk of the ideas of freedom and the pursuit of truthfulness, but um, you could say that through the conditioning and the way we're brought up that these f freedoms and the pursuit of truth are limited to the bounds of your own like, mind and the way you're brought up. So how can you expect to um, pursue true happiness when the freedoms and the decisions you make are pretty much inside a little bubble of your own um, bringing up. Nope. Yeah, so uh, there's a massive debate in psychology. Uh, we've heard two sides of it here a little bit, um, which say that we're basically determined by two factors. Uh, there's one party that says we're really determined by uh, how we're brought up, and we're conditioned by how we're brought up, and everything is determined by how we're brought up. And then there's the other faction that somebody mentioned earlier that we're really conditioned by our genes. And we're completely determined by evolution to behave in particular ways. And that's the bubble, is whatever genes we have conditioning our perspective. And then the real radicals, it seems, right now, are the people who think, oh, it's a, bit, a little bit of both. Now, I think they're all full of it. I think there's a third reason that shapes who we are and what you are that has nothing to do with the environment and has nothing to do with your genes. And that's who? Who gets to shape who you are? 
Who gets to really shape your character? You do. You actually make choices. I believe in free will. I think it's almost impossible to stand up here and advocate for anything if you don't believe in free will. What would be the point, right? I believe that you shape your own character. You say, yes, you grow up in a bubble of your own environment. One of the reasons to have free speech is so you can break out of that bubble. You can be exposed to new ideas. You can be exposed to something that your parents or your, or your, or your school didn't expose you to. One of the beauties of a university, a university that really has free speech, is you get exposed to radicals from this perspective and radicals from that perspective and people that are right in the middle and all kinds of things in between. And you get to shape your own experiences. You get to shape your own ideas based on all these facts that you are learning. You don't have to accept this professor's view or that professor's view or this student's view. You get to decide which one of those. If we limit free speech, then we're limiting ourselves to the bubble. Then we're saying, oh, you guys were raised in a middle class household and you're way too sensitive to be exposed to these ideas. So just keep the bubble that you have. I want to prick the bubble. I want to expose you to new ideas. I want to expose you to something you've never heard before. So that you, who are ultimately in control of your own destiny, get to consider all these different ideas and make decisions based on all these ideas based on what you think is good for you, what you think is true, what you think is right. I want you to use your reason to escape your environment, to escape your upbringing. Hey, my parents think I'm crazy because I've rejected what I grew up with. I've rejected everything that they try to teach me. You know? And I don't say you should as well, but you should at least be exposed to ideas that are different than what you were brought up with, and you get to decide what kind of ideas you want. You're, and you're at exactly the age, right? Somewhere between 16 and 30. After 30, you're not going to reconsider ideas. Nobody changes their mind about anything important after the age of 30. Uh, nobody is an exaggeration. Very few people. Yeah, it's, life becomes routine. You have a family. You have a job. You do your work. Uh, you're busy. It, the mind calcifies a little bit. You're just at the age where you're starting to think for yourself. You're just at the age where you're discovering new knowledge where you're integrating that knowledge, where you get to look out in the world with your own eyes, not your parents' eyes, not your teacher's eyes, but your eyes, you now get to shape who you are going to become. This, a, this time in high school and in college might be the most important time of your life. And now you want to create an artificial bubble around it and not expose yourself to ideas that might offend you is to guarantee that you stay in the bubble that you were trained to stay in. And, and, and that would be sad. No, go out there and experiment. Go out there and think new thoughts. Read authors that, that are new and different and exciting. And figure it out for yourself. Use your reason to decide what is true and what is not. As an advocate for free speech, uh, I was wondering what you thought about how in many places, and in fact places like this, uh, it's frowned upon to talk about or argue for the ridiculousness of religion uh, and how that can sort of be overcome and how it, you can argue, for, argue against many things, but religion sort of is uh, safeguarded, and how that can be overcome. Well, I mean, I don't think, obviously, I don't think religion should be safeguarded. It, it is true that in history, religion has been the number one oppressor of free speech, because religion doesn't want and doesn't believe anything should question. I mean, this is the premise of the Enlightenment. The Enlightenment turns religion upside down. Because what happens until the Enlightenment? Until the Enlightenment, where does knowledge come from? Where does knowledge come from? Well, God and his, and his missionaries and his people who communicate with God, because not all of us can communicate with God, at least not until the, the Reformation. And even then, since there is no God, nobody got to communicate with him. Sorry if I offended anybody, but that's okay. Um, nobody actually communicated with God. So the authorities dictated to you what was true and what was not what was right and what was wrong. And if you wanted to understand the movement of the planets, you went to an old book written 2,000 years earlier and looked it up, and there it said that the earth, that the sun goes around the earth. And that was the truth. And if you suggested something otherwise, that was offensive. And that was anti, because the truth came from above. It was platonic, right? So if you read Plato in the, the metaphor of the cave, Plato says that we all live in a cave, 
And what we see with our senses are just shadows. We don't see reality. Real reality, only the philosopher kings go out into the sunlight and they can see the true world, the world of forms, right, that none of us ordinary people can see. So we need philosophers to guide our lives. Every authoritarian regime ultimately is platonic, right? The, the communist, why do the communists need a dictator? They have to have a dictator. Because how do we know what the proletarian needs? Somebody has to commune through some kind of mystical way with the proletarian, the spirit of the proletarian, to know what's good and what's just and what's right and convey it to all of us and, of course, force us to behave that way. Right? How, does, how does the Aryan race in Germany know what's right? Well, you need somebody, Hitler, to be able to commune with the Aryan race and be able, all of these are Plato's kings in one form or another. Catholic Church is exactly the same way. How do we know what God wants? We need a pope who can commune with God and let us all know. So we need that authority. And anybody who challenges that authority is a threat. So free speech is a threat. Free speech is a threat to the whole notion of religion which says truth comes from above. It doesn't come from our mind interacting with reality. It doesn't come from our senses learning scientifically about the world out there. So yes, religion has always been a threat to free speech. It has to be the more fundamentalist you are. Um, the Enlightenment says no. The Enlightenment says no. Individual human beings using their reason can discover the truth. They don't need to commune with the spirits, any kind of spirits. All they need is the scientific method to discover truth. And that's what they rely on. And that overturns, and it's not an accident. I mean, Locke has to escape England, right? Because he's worried that, that the Catholic king is a Charles, who's the last, uh, the, you know, is going to prosecute him because of what, what's he, you know, what he's writing, right? So, uh, it's always been a threat. Uh, uh, Voltaire has to escape Paris. They all go to the Amsterdam. Amsterdam, even back then, was a place where you escaped uh, to. Right? There was more freedom there than anywhere else. So uh, it, it, it's always been a constant threat. And you know, religion, like any other set of ideas, religion is a view of the world, should be debated, should be discussed. And the mechanism to evaluate its truth or falsehood is the same mechanism we should use for everything else, which is what? Human reason. You know, and then, then you can evaluate, you can discuss it. Um, you spoke about uh, reason and individualism as definitions for the Western civilization. Yeah. Um, the, surely the purpose of reason is to, uh, as you said, prick someone's bubble. Um, I would argue, uh, you know, uh, stop them from, uh, from living in their own thoughts and challenge them. Um, I'd argue that to do that individually isn't as effective as to do it with uh, a background of supporters and a background of help. Um, so, so therefore, I would argue that individualism and, and reason kind of contradict each other as a, as a basis for a Western civilization. Do you not, do you not think that they're, they're... Well, could you explain to me your, your choices of uh, yeah, so individualism? It's not that individualism mean you're an island and should live as an island and not interact with other people. Obviously, there's enormous benefit to interacting with other people. And, uh, and, and it, it, you learn from an Isaac Newton about physics, and you learn from people all the time. And that relationship with other people is incredibly valuable. So individualism doesn't mean living on a desert island. That, that would be anti-individualistic, because if you're individualist and you want your own happiness, you want to be with other people, other people of incredible value to you. What individualism means as an ism, as a theory, right? It means that the individual is the unit of value. It's not the group. It's not what ethnic group you belong to. It's not the color of your skin. It's not who you hang out with. People should be evaluated as individuals, and they should be treated as individuals. That's, and the reason for that is, is you know, kind of simple once we discover reason. If we can all think, who does the thinking? Who thinks? We do as I do, and you do, right? We don't, uh, who does the eating, right? Do we have a collective stomach? No, right? You have to eat for yourself. We don't have a collective brain. There's no collective consciousness floating over above us doing the thinking for us as a group. Each one of us has to do his thinking. Now, we can debate, we can discuss, we can 
improve each other's thinking through discussion and debate. But at the end of the day, you are responsible for your thinking because only you can do your thinking. Nobody else can do it for you. That's the sense of which individualism comes from reason. Once we understand that that is, see, if the truth comes from over there, then we as a group might be able to receive that truth in some collectivistic way, right? Because our minds are not important. It's some kind of acceptance that's important. But once you acknowledge the truth comes from the human mind, from its understanding of reality, which is real out there, then only you can do that as an individual. Nobody else can do it for you. That's the sense in which it's individualistic. And the consequence of that politically are that under the law, we treat people, we don't, we don't uh, punish you for the sins of your father. You don't punish you for the sins of your class or for the sins of your ethnic group. I mean, ideally, right, because we do, unfortunately, punish you sometimes for the color of your skin and things like that. But ideally, we punish you only for the sins that you commit. And the same thing with rewards. You have to earn your rewards as an individual. You don't get special benefits for being an aristocrat, for having the right family name, for, for, for having something that has nothing to do with you and what you are as an individual. So politically, it becomes very important. You, you know, we each have a vote. We, we each have, have, a, have a view politically. And the job of government is to protect us as individuals, not as members of groups. And I think, again, Western civilization, in my view today, is breaking apart to a large extent because we're reverting to tribalism. We're going back to who belongs to which tribe, who belongs to, you know, whether it's the color of our skin or whether it's our ethnic group or whether it's, uh, you know, uh, the belief system that we have in terms of religion. We're clustering around little tribes. Right? And that, to me, is the breakup. That's pre-enlightenment West, but that's not civilization. That's anti-civilization. Civilization is when we try to start treating people, individuals, as individuals and not as members of groups. Uh, this is less so to do with freedom of speech, but more of government. Sure. Uh, what is your opinion on having a flat tax rate and also a negative income tax? Um, I mean, I don't like taxes, period. Any taxes, flat, not flat, doesn't matter. But I think a progressive income tax that is, you pay more income taxes, a percentage higher, as you make more money, is downright offensive and evil, right? So the more you produce, the more you create, the more you build, the harder you work, the more value you produce, the more they take away from you. That, to me, is, is ridiculous. If anything, it should be an inverted tax rate, because the more you produce, the less you owe, right? How do you, how do you become a billionaire? How do you become a billionaire? How do you become really, really, really rich in a free market? Now, without manipulating government and stealing and stuff like that. How do you, in a free market, how do you become a billionaire? By creating goods and services that people want. Creating goods and services that millions and millions and millions of people want. The only way to become a billionaire is by making the world a better place to live for millions of people. And now you owe them 50% of your income? because you, you, you've made the world a better place, they penalize you for that. So a flat tax is a huge improvement. Um, generally, if you, tax, what, if you tax something, do you think you get more of it or less of it? If I tax you on some behavior, do you think I get more of that behavior or less of that behavior? So I take away stuff from you every time you engage in particular behavior. Are you gonna do that more or are you gonna do that less? Less. If I subsidize something, do you get more of it or less of it? I give you money every time you do something. You get more. So if I tax work, do you think you get more work or less work? Less. If I subsidize um, not working, do you think I get more not working or less not working? More not working. So, I, you know, the incentive structure is completely messed up in the welfare state. Completely upside down. We shouldn't be taxing income at all. If anything, economically, if you want to tax, if you have to tax anything, you, you tax consumption, you don't tax production. Uh, and yeah, so a flat tax is better than the alternative, but, and, and, but it, it's impossible today. I mean, we love to vilify the rich. I mean, they are one of these little collectives that we can blame every, 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 all our problems on and, and, uh, and, and then squeeze them for more money. 
you know, whenever, whenever we, we, need, we think we need more, so we, we, we go after them. We particularly love vilifying bankers. I mean, financiers are like at the top of the list of people to hate. Unjustly. You said that if we remove force, then people are free to think, reason out, and we'll get closer to the truth by yeah. that process. Um, would it be even better if we force people to listen to those ideas? No, because you can't force people to think. You can force people to listen, but you can't force people to think. And um, there's no value in giving somebody what you believe is something positive if you're forcing them to do it. The va the, to actually benefit from it, I have to be voluntarily engaged in it. I mean, even the kids who are forced to be here are going to be getting less from this than the kids who are not forced to be here. Because just mentally, their whole attitude towards the lecture is going to be different, right? If you do something voluntary, your, 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 your relationship to that material is different. Now, there's a sense in which we do force people by sending them to school, right? And they get exposed to these ideas. The parents force them in a sense, whether they like it or not. They're here to get exposed to it. But I think once you're an adult, it's, it's your moral responsibility as an individual to expose yourself to, to ideas and to engage with those ideas. And I think, I think forcing people to do anything is wrong. I think there is a contradiction in your argument. To begin with, you said that we are we don't trust anyone to set the limits on free speech, right? Here we are. Yet later on you said that we should all be free from violence and somebody pointing again at our head and then you backed it up by saying we should never incite violence and use the never example incite of incite violence. Incite yeah. violence. Yeah. And then use the example of the Holocaust denial. But then arguably with reason and evidence, I can prove to you that the people that deny the Holocaust also uh, commit crimes against Jews and anti-Semitism. So why is that not allowed, if that makes sense? So if you can violent? show me that somebody commits crimes against Jews, then they should go to jail for committing the crimes against Jews. But being a Holocaust denier is not a crime against anybody. It's just stupid. It's just wrong. But it's not a crime. And they're not inciting violence. Now, if they say, let's all go outside and kill some Jews, that's inciting to violence, and that's wrong. But if I say, the Holocaust didn't happen, and, all, and, and here's, I've, I've written books about all these things that prove that the Holocaust didn't happen. It's all garbage. But that's not inciting violence. It's not a crime. It, 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 it hasn't punched anybody in the, fist, in the face. It hasn't stolen anybody, anything from anybody. It's upset people emotionally. But, but we get upset from things that have nothing to do with Holocaust denial. We, we get upset for when people say all kinds of things to us. So is our being upset now the standard for what, is, what should be allowed to be said and what shouldn't be allowed to say? Is, have we now elevated our emotions above everything else? So you're upset, get over it. I mean, I, I get, I'm incredibly upset when people deny the Holocaust. I think it's absurd, it's ridiculous. My family members died in the Holocaust. But so what if I get upset? It doesn't, if I silence them, the next point is going to be, Iran, you upset kids when you advocate for capitalism. Because you know what? They're not taught capitalism, and it's, it's controversial, and it's upsetting. And some people get offended when I say government shouldn't be the authority. Right? Where's the limit? If, if emotions are the standard, then speech is dead. All speech is dead. Then we're, we're back in the days of authoritarians ruling our lives and determining what is true and what is not. I don't want that. You, you don't want to. I, I would never go to listen to a Holocaust denier. I, I don't buy their books. I don't engage with them. But if they want to talk, let them talk. If reason is so valued and the capacity for reason, therefore, is so valued, why is it not justified for a government to provide and fund facilities that nurture the best possible capacity for that reason, i.e. taxation to fund state schools? Because the government is the wrong institution to do that. The essence of government is coercion. The essence of government is force and a gun. Everything the government does is backed up by, if you don't do what we say, you go to jail. That's the es essence of government. It's the ability to coerce you. right? Reason is the opposite. Reason is about exploring and discovering truth without limits. Right? So 
To bring a gun into a school is wrong. To relate to something that just happened. I, I don't mean it in that sense. But for, for the government then to start running school, what happens? Well, the government then decides what is true and what is false. What should be taught and what shouldn't be taught. What is good history and what is bad history. What is good mathematics and what is bad mathematics. The government has no ability to, to do that. The government has no standards by which to do that. The government knows a gun. It knows coercion. What I want is I want real competition in schools. I want innovation. I want people to be able to uh, choose the school that their children go to instead of being dictated by a government official which school they should go to and therefore what curriculum they should study. I don't think the government should be involved in ideas at all. I don't think the government should have any position on any idea except what is fraud, what is murder, what, you know, what are crimes so they can defend us against them. But other than that, it shouldn't have a position on what is the right history and what is the wrong history. This is Poland. Poland says, no, no, no. the Poles weren't anti-Semites. They, they, you know, it's just the Nazis. It's just the Germans. It should all be blamed on the Germans. We Poles are great. This is government policy. They're dictating history. No, history should be debated in, in, in history faculty meetings and people can disagree and let the facts pan out in terms of what really happened during World War II in Poland. But now, because the schools are run by the government, right, you're going to get a particular version of history taught to all students. That's not inducive of reason. What's inducive of reason is schools that are private, that are competing, that are innovative, that are trying to, trying to actually educate, not propagandize. And my problem with public, public education is reversed in the UK. My problem with government schools is it, it's, it's, they're going to prop propagandize. Government has no business and ideas. And they don't do a good job running schools. I mean, I, I ask audiences in the United States, I mean, I mean, two questions, right? One, what would this look like if the government designed it? What would it look like if a government committee built this? Right? Horrible. Dysfunctional. Nobody believes that the government should do what Apple does, right? Or Samsung or any of these companies. Right? They can't do it. They're not competent. But the brains of our children, reason, that's so insignificant we'll give to the government. Right? Or the post office. Anybody, anybody wants uh, to mail a letter and make sure it gets to the other side within a day. How many people use the post office versus FedEx or UPS? Everybody uses FedEx or UPS if they really care about the letter. But our children's minds are less important than our mail. That will work. Now, your parents, obviously, are spending a lot of money to send you here because they care, right? So, oh, no, we'll leave the public schools, those awful places, the government schools, those awful places just for poor kids because we don't care about them. That's awful. I want poor kids to have the same quality education you guys do. And only a private school can provide that. And only real competition can provide that. I want to create a system by which all children go to private schools that are good, that are competing, that, are, that, 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 that partially they're competing to get kids because that's how they make money. So I think education is way too important to give to the government and way too important to give to a government whose job is a gun. That's their essential characteristic. Force and coercion should not be part of school. Yeah, you were talking about how the breakup of society into tribalism, yes. you're saying, is yeah. a major reason why the West is in decline. Uh, but surely by unlimiting freedom of speech, you're marginalizing these groups and just making the, sit making the situation worse for these groups and pushing the West further into decline. Quite the contrary. Quite the contrary. So um, if the standard is, if the standard for free speech is insult, right, then Everybody's being insulted all the time by all, all kinds of groups, right? I, you know, I, I've often uh, claimed that I'm just a child of privilege, right? That's pretty insulting. I don't think I'm a child of privilege. I think I earned everything that I've got. And I'm insulted by that. So should we ban people being able to say that I'm a child of privilege, right? It, does, it works in both directions, right? It doesn't just work at those groups. Those groups have the ability to defend themselves. They have as individuals the ability to speak up and, and, and challenge anything that is said against them. You don't protect people by coddling them. If, if, what, they, if what they represent is, is good, 
then they will win out in the, in the debate that has to happen, right? So I don't, I don't feel safer as a Jew because Holocaust deniers go to jail. Actually, I feel worse because it worries me that we give them so much importance, so much credence that we put them in jail. They, I think they gain notoriety as a consequence. I think they disappear from the world if we actually let them say what they say. If people around us are racist and say racist things, then ostracize them. You know, treat them like they deserve to be treated. You can argue against them for a while, but if they're not convincible, then ignore them. That's much more effective than saying you're not allowed to say what you say. You can still stay a racist. You're still going to still be a racist, but just you can't say it. No group is better off because of that. I can't think of a single so-called marginalized group that is better off by silencing its so-called critics. Quite the opposite. It gives those critics much more credence than they deserve. Do you think opinions are um, just emotions? And if so, then do you think some are superior to others? So no, I don't think opinions are just emotions. I think opinions shouldn't be emotions. I think opinions should be a product of your reasoning. Opinions should be a product of logic and thinking. And as such, yes, some opinions are better than others because some opinions are true and some opinions are, are false. Uh, op opinions that are based on emotions are not opinions. They're, 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 just, they're just something floating in your mind. And they're usually untrue. Or they're not true to you because you haven't grounded them in facts and in reality. So if you hold an opinion about anything, if you come out of this speech and say, oh yeah, I agree with Iran. I agree with what the speaker said today. That means nothing unless you can explain it to yourself, ground it in some facts, in reality, right? And the same if you disagree with me. You know, if you disagree with me, you should be able to ground it in particular facts. This is why, this is the logic of my opinion. So my goal here is not to get you to agree with me, although that would be nice. My goal is to get you thinking properly about these topics. What is the logic of the argument? Do I accept that logic? Do I think it's flawed? Do I think it's wrong? And where do I think it's wrong? Emotions have nothing to do with it. Emotions are irrelevant to logic. <clears throat> so ben Shapiro has a nice little quote. Uh, I don't know, facts, facts don't care about your emotions. The question is, what are the facts? The question is, what is the truth? Not how you feel about it. How you feel is nice and important, but not the end game. Um, I'd just like to, uh, a little bit more of an explanation on your libertarian stance against government. And I what? Your libertarian stance against government. So you say, you know, government no, is this I, coercive force yeah. with a gun and yeah. you don't like how that, uh, how it is the one funding state school education and it is the one that decides what we learn as students. But do you not accept that government not only being there to defend us against people who might use violence against us, is also there as a a body, again, as you said in your own words, servants of the people uh, are there f to ensure that we get um, a tasteful and well-rounded education and other such things. Whereas if you perhaps gave uh, matters like those off to uh, independent places, uh, you may not get um, such a broader thing. Um, uh, for example, by the way, uh, this is a private school not run by the government. We are a charity. But we all take exams that are funded by the government, yeah. uh, and therefore the curriculum is set by the government, regardless of the fact that we are private. Yeah, I think that's awful. I think that's terrible, <laughs> because it forces your teachers to teach to an exam set by some bureaucrat who considers himself an expert on the field. What if your teacher disagrees with the expert? What if your teacher doesn't think that that expert is right? What if that expert um, what if that expert now is an agent, uh, is, 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 has a particular political agenda and is teaching you in a particular political way, which I think they are, by the way, a particular political way about what is true and what is not because they happen to come from a Catholic background, a Marxist background, a free market background, it doesn't matter. Whatever the particular background they came from is now what is being dictated as your curriculum. And not just your curriculum, because you are going to be influenced by your teachers. One, Every child in England has to think about this particular issue exactly the same. Even though your professors all disagree. Right? If, I, if I take, you've, you've, got, you've got professors who think about history, about facts of history. You've got some professors who think X, other professors think Y. We, we just had a conversation over dinner about the virtues of World War I. 
And we had one professor saying World War I was a complete waste of time, should have never happened, and another, another teacher saying, oh, no, no, there were some really important issues relating to World War I. Well, what's the truth? Oh, the government should decide what the truth is between those. That's the agency that we want to decide what you should be taught. No. I don't want the government to have one uniform curriculum. I want there to be schools teaching different things. I want there to be schools that teach, in some cases, unfortunately, falsehoods. Like, again, not to insult anybody, religious schools. They're going to be teaching falsehoods. But people have a right to learn falsehoods. And parents have a right to decide their children should be raised under a certain type of falsehood. So yes, there should be Islamic schools and Jewish schools and Catholic schools and Protestant schools and secular schools. And let parents make those decisions, not a government bureaucrat in terms of what the curriculum is going to be and what is considered well-rounded and what isn't considered well-rounded. And I bet you what is considered well-rounded but when a conservative government is different than what's considered well-rounded in a leftist government. And what's considered well-rounded today is very different than what was considered 30 years ago. And who gets to decide which one of them are right? I don't want to give anybody that kind of authority over knowledge, over what is true. I want individuals to make their minds up. And the only way for individuals to make their minds up is for teachers to feel free to teach what they think is right and for parents to be able to decide and then for you to go to university and be exposed to a wide array of views and then make your own choices. Luckily, the government doesn't yet set curriculum for universities. Because if they did then, then we'd really be all, all homogenized, all exactly the same. And that would be a horrible world. I don't want us all to be the same. So while there is such a thing as the truth, I think there is such a thing as the truth. It's not an issue of opinion. It's not the government's job to decide what that truth is. Because government, I mean, particularly government today, um, I'll take the United States, not because I don't know enough about the politics here. Um, if, if a Republican is in power, then it turns out that evolution is false. It doesn't exist. And, uh, and uh, you know, that's, that, that's bad stuff. If a Democrat in power, then it turns out that, I don't know, uh, uh, free markets have never worked and it always created disaster throughout human history. I mean, what's the truth? And what are they, how do they come to their conclusions? Most of their conclusions they come to based on the pressure groups that are putting pressure on them, the political process, who, wh how they gain votes, you're a Republican, if you're a Republican and you admit that evolution is actually a science and true, then the evangelicals are not going to vote for you. And that's what determines what position you take, not the truth. It's politics. Politics and the truth, if you haven't figured this out, this, this is an important real world fact. Politics and the truth have nothing to do with one another. Indeed, politics today, more than ever, is about the art of lying. Just look at Donald Trump. It's about the art of deception. It's not, about, it's not about seeking and finding the truth. Not in the political world we go. But those same politicians, those same politicians who lie about Brexit and who lie about the economy and who lie about bankers and who lie about all this stuff, they're going to get the truth right when it comes to your education. And they're setting the exams just right to get the truth just the way it should be. Sorry, I, I, I can't trust them and I don't trust them. And what I trust is the kind of marketplace that builds this. That's beautiful. That's really cool. And you know what created this? Freedom, innovation, entrepreneurship, and competition. I want freedom, innovation, entrepreneurship, and competition in schools. I want your teachers to compete for your minds. I don't want it to just be automatic. And, and again, you guys have the, the, the great benefit of having parents who can afford to send you to a, a relatively competitive to, to, to school that, that, that is striving to please you because they want your parents' money, right? I know you're a nonprofit, but still, right? Um, <laughs> poor kids don't have that advantage. Poor kids don't have that advantage, and that's sad. I'd like them to compete, and, and there are plenty of examples, and I would recommend a book by the name of A Beautiful Tree by James Tooley, a, a British scholar, who looks at private schools in the slums of Calcutta and Nigeria and finds that in the slums of Calcutta, uh, parents send they would far better prefer to send their kids to private schools than to public schools. They prefer to pay rather than to get something for free for a variety of reasons he explains in the book. But there are hundreds of little private schools in these slums. 
poor parents can afford to send their kids to private schools as well when there's real competition, real freedom, real innovation in that sector. And that's, that's the kind of stuff, that's what inspires me, is progress, not the, 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 the stagnation of, that is produced by bureaucracies, which is what, which is what government produces. Uh, all right, thank you.